The Working Preacher team holds you in prayer during this difficult time. God bless you for all the ways you proclaim the gospel. And may God be with you as you navigate this new way of doing your ministry. We believe that biblical preaching changes lives, and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. In this ongoing pandemic, many preachers may feel isolated, but Working Preacher is still there with preachers for every week through the podcast and our website to provide support during this time. If you or a preacher you know depends on Working Preacher, both for sermon writing and spiritual strength, now is the time to support it financially. If you're already a sustainer, your increased participation at any level enables us to continue updating these resources to support preachers and lay leaders during this time when they need it most. We cannot keep working preacher up to date or even open without the generous support of donors. I'm so grateful for your help. Thank you for keeping working preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon King with me, Rolf Exegetic. Wait, did you say? Yeah, I've rebranded us. Uh, uh, um, Tiger King. So since Tiger King has Joe Exotic, um, I, I've decided I'm uh, Rolf Exegetic. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for May 10th, 2020. And the texts are Acts 7, 55 through 60, Psalm 31, 1 through 5, and 15 through 16, 1 Peter 2, 2 through 10, and John 14, 1 through 14. Um, one, uh, just a word of introduction. Um, we are recording this uh, on April 14th, looking ahead, and it could be that um, we are still um, hunkering down in social, social distancing and kind of quarantine, but it could be uh, that, you know, by mid-May, um, that reality started to loosen up. So just uh, uh, stick with us. We're not really aware of uh, what's happened, um, but... Um, the, the dates in our state have been pointing ahead towards um, gradual um, ending of the uh, quarantine. And I'm going to take us back to history just to say that on this day, May 10th, 1869, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, connecting all of the United States of America. Mm, very good. Well, I, uh, here we are in the farewell discourse of John, uh, which there is always the, uh, this part, this period after Easter is uh, selections from the farewell discourse. But I, uh, when I was talking about this uh, earlier on in the pandemic uh, with, with people, I uh, really struck by these verses uh, in that context of but one of the things that we maybe don't appreciate as much as we should about uh, these particular chapters is that this is Jesus at his pastoral best. Uh, he knows that he is leaving, uh, departing to the Father, he, but he also is uh, quite aware of of what is to come, and but in particular, the uh, the reality that uh, he will no longer be with his disciples, and so you know these words of "Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me." I think they're going to be heard very differently this year, um, particularly since this is a very frequent uh, text for funerals, and. But it's this, it is this promise of, of Jesus as, as pastor who, uh, who and, and all, of these, uh, all of these words of Jesus really should be heard in that spirit or in that vein, including John 14, 6, uh, because this is one of those very uh, famous verses that gets lifted out of context to justify a um, exclusive uh, uh, the exclusive exclusivity of of christianity that jesus is the only way to god 
Uh, and if you don't follow the way, then you know where you're going. And, and in fact, this uh, John 14, 6 is a response to Thomas's question. Uh, we, don't, we don't know the way. And the way is not geographical. The way is not, uh, the, the way is not uh, an expediency. Uh, but the way is relationship. Uh, and it's this, uh, it's the, it's the promise of the abiding relationship with Jesus. So a uh, number of different things, different directions you can go with this passage, but, uh, it, you know, that, uh, that recognition of 14.6 is, uh, is about particularity, which is not the same as exclusivity. And, uh, and just to hear these words of Jesus uh, to us, uh, particularly in times of, of separation and times of, uh, of worry and, uh, and, and, heart, and troubled hearts. I also think the, um, the image of, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house is important because it's an image of hospitality. It, um, it actually is based in the Old Testament practice of when a traveler was coming through uh, a, 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 a region and would stop uh, at a village. And, and this is also the background of when Jesus sends out the, the, the 70 and says, you know, uh, stay wherever you are welcomed. Um, there was no, there were no, um, you know, uh, hotels, no, uh, you know, what do, what do they call this? Uh, uh, no Marriott's, no JW Marriott's. And so, so, the idea was that there were sleeping places uh, is really uh, rather than dwelling places, you know, just places to be. Uh, and the idea was you were, uh, you were expected to take in travelers and hospitality. But then, so Jesus is going to uh, the father's play, uh, father's house, um, which is the literal term in the Old Testament for a home, the house of a father or the house of a mother in Ruth. Um, where there would be permanent abiding places for uh, for us because of the relationship that um, and the the relationship we have with Christ and the way that the um, res resurrected and ascended Christ has made for us to the Father. Yeah, that's an important point, Rolf, because uh, this this often gets translated in my Father's house. There are many rooms, or uh, and when, in fact, the, the Greek root there is the same verb that has been used you know, consistently um, uh, throughout the Gospel Menno. of John of Menno, right? So it's in my father, literally in my father's house, there are many menes, biting places. And so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an important connection because the disciples have heard this invitation to abide uh, and that biting is is equivalent to a relationship, and so what Jesus is trying to say here is that even that even with this separation, that relationship is secure uh, i 'm not abandoning that relationship, and that that abiding that uh, really is to go back to four forty two and the Samaritans uh, is really salvific uh, it 's salvation uh, it 's just the salvation the salvific life here and now and so jesus is um, Jesus is drawing on that entirety of what does abiding look like uh, and what does abiding mean and it 's this intimate relationship with Jesus that that will not go away that 's not what that that 's not that 's not going to go away and then and then to think of this in the context of of you know, the chapter after this of uh, chapter 15, which is uh, the last chapter or the last uh, I am statement with a predicate nominative. And that last I am statement with a predicate nominative, I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, abide in me as I abide in you is then is something that again is emphasizing uh, that, uh, that connectedness. And that can, and even with Jesus, as I said, even with just Jesus' separation and returning to the Father, uh, that return to the Father is all for the sake of preparing this abiding place. So a lot of really beautiful uh, promise-oriented uh, imagery here that I think uh, would indeed uh, lessen the, the troubled hearts in the congregation. I have one question for you, Caroline, but, uh, but first, Matt and Joy, you want to jump in first? 
Uh, I was going to pull it back in, in terms of what uh, Caroline was saying in terms of it, it being invitational and not exclusive on the, on the same idea of preparing uh, that there are many places. This is uh, the promise of the God who has always wanted to dwell with us, uh, truly Emmanuel, God with us. And, and, and here comes this promise again, that even though Jesus is going, they will not be alone. Um, but just in a bit of silliness, I once heard a, a, a preacher uh, doing this, and um, if, if you've got enough nerve to sing on this, this is a moment where the disciples are asking this question, and it's, it's like Jesus is saying, if you don't know me by now, <laughs> will never, never, never know me. And then the disciples go, ooh. But what happens in that moment, we talk about Thomas, which Caroline, you already brought up, um, but also Philip is here. And while both of them don't get it, and they're not saying, I don't get it, I'm gone. You know, uh, Philip doesn't say, I don't understand, I'm gone. Both of them are leaning in. And it's an invitation for us to not say, well, if you don't understand this right now, it, it, I don't believe in you, you don't have any hope anymore, you're, you're out. But it's to have the patience of Jesus to say, if you don't know me now, let me explain it to you one more time. My God, the God who Jesus calls Father, has always been seeking to dwell among the people. And that's what I'm here to make available for you. I think also, before we get to your question, Ralph, I think, you know, just you just reminded me of another really uh, important point about this passage is that it comes uh, directly on the heels of the prediction of Peter's denial. And, and also Judas's betrayal. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we heard that passage, of course, John 13 uh, on Monday, Thursday, and, but uh, the omitted verses, of course, are, are Judas leaving. And so this do not, hearts, do not let your hearts be troubled is not just kind of this random thought, but it's, it's, uh, it's the fact that Jesus has washed his disciples' feet uh, one of the disciples has left the building, uh, and the other one, Jesus says, you will betray me. And that, then Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. So uh, this is, uh, there's, a, there's a really significant contextuality about broken relationship into which Jesus speaks the promise of, of the relationship that he will always have. Rolf, you had a question for me. I can't I wait. do, uh, briefly before, because we do need to move on, but so... What? Oh. I know, okay, yeah. but so in John, right at the end of this passage, yeah, uh, I've got to pull it back up here. It says, if you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Now, Caroline, you might not know this, but earlier in John, it says no one has ever seen God. It is only the son who is close to the father who has made yeah. him known. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could unpack that connection for us. Well, that, that's, the, that's the connection that, that Jesus is trying to make here is that uh, whoever, you know, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's been Jesus' entire mission, if you will, Jesus' entire purpose uh, as the word made flesh. You're, you're referring back then to John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, you know, the one and only who is close to the Father's uh, bosom, who has made God known. And so uh, that made God known is, uh, is, can be translated, you know, declare or reveal. But this is, this is, in, this is uh, the, the heart of the theology of John, right? Is that in Jesus, we don't, we don't only know uh, Jesus, but we, we are brought into this, this intimate relationship with God. And, and that's in part what, uh, there's a lot of that language, of course, here in the farewell discourse. I am in you, you are me. I'm in the Father, you know, and it gets a little, uh, gets a little circular and 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 um, maybe a little bit much. But the point is, is to invite the disciples to recognize that um, the relationship that they've shared with Jesus uh, is is great and wonderful, but it's 
what it really is leading to is this, and it, what it really reveals is the relationship that they'll have with the Father. And, and doesn't it also reveal the nature of God the Father? I mean, that is, mm-hmm. I think oftentimes Absolutely. we project all these power images on God the Father, especially yeah, because we say God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Yeah. But um, that is the Jesus who's going around serving the poor, healing uh, people born blind, welcoming the... Uh, you know, and then sending the woman at the well, yeah. the Jesus who dies in our place. I mean, that's the nature of the Father. Yeah. And I, I just think that um, that's essential to the theology, not just of John, but the entire New Testament, that the yeah, and, and, and a, most and a complete God revelation that, of God's character is the life of Jesus. And, that I, and a God that, uh, that desires deeply an intimate relationship with us. Uh, that this is a relational God, a God that doesn't want, a God that that uh, desires that. And so that is so, that's really strong here. It's an, I think it's an important point. And despite our questions, despite our not understanding, despite our failure, all of these actions are bringing us back into relationship with the God who from mm-hmm. the very beginning wants to be with all of us. Mm-hmm. Time to go on. <laughs> Acts. Matt, you've been quiet. Oh, over. hey. <clears throat> no, I'm just, I'm just hanging out, just listening, learning a lot about John. I'm just thinking if I was a lay preacher, this would really help me craft a faithful sermon. There's a book about that. Hey, Caroline. <laughs> Is there? Oh yeah, there is a book that uh, came out uh, just uh, just about a week ago or so, and here it is: How to Craft a Faithful Sermon, Lay Preacher's Guide. But if you need like a little brush up on your on your preaching technique, and I do, <laughs> I've noticed that I wasn't going to say anything though. Uh, that uh, this is available from Working Preacher Books and Fortress Press. So here you go. Thank you. you also need help. There's always, there's Stephen as well, who was a lay preacher and um, it went really well for him. So <laughs> hopefully you've got advice for that, Caroline. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Acts 7, this is an odd pairing for, for Easter for some. I liken it to, uh, you know, in year with Christmas, just after the Christmas story, you get the story of the slaughter of the innocents by Herod and everybody's like, I thought this was supposed to be a happy time of the year. Uh, so that's a reminder of the dangerous of Christmas, here we have a sense of Easter carrying its own danger mm-hmm. as well. Uh, you have to set this into a context, uh, of course. Um, I don't think you need to necessarily redo Stephen's sermon, but you should talk about that part of what he's saying is that God has always been present where God wants to be present. He's also uh, I- issuing accusations or indictments uh, for the death of Jesus, but then it's you know, the, the stories we've seen in Acts so far in this Easter season are about people, well, Peter, bearing witness to Jesus. And now Stephen bears witness to Jesus in his own way and through dying, which, of course, the, the, the history of martyrdom and the long history of the church has been one of the ways in which the church has borne witness to its Easter hope. Mm. Not that I'm necessarily commending that to people today. There are other ways that I would prefer to bear witness personally, but that you know, what's noteworthy is that Stephen dies just like Jesus dies. So there's Mm -hmm. all these connections that Luke draws between Stephen's death and Jesus' death. And one of the messages there is we live like Jesus uh, and we also die like Jesus. So we we live with him and we also die with him. If I can start to steal some some Pauline language there, Uh, even now, right? Even in our own existence. Uh, I'm glad that I live in a place where Living as a person, <clears throat> excuse me, as a person of faith is, is relatively without consequence or risk. Uh, but it's important to note this because this is still the experience of believers in many parts of the world. And I want to circle back around to how you started. Um, uh, and, and it also pairs up with what Ralph was saying about um, what is truly the character of God, because Stephen was chosen to uh, wait tables and and to to care for the the widows and the orphans. And yet he, as a lay person, as you started out, uh, Matt, was capable of proclaiming a a testimony to who God, who Jesus reveals God to be. And that was why um, he was uh, uh, 
uh, to use the words from Peter last uh, week, he was brought to suffering that led to death. Uh, and, and it was that not that it wasn't just that he could wait on a table. It wasn't just because he could serve a plate, but it was because he could bear witness in testimony to who Jesus is, not just in his actions, but by his words. And I think it's important for us to realize that that is our vocation, not just to do the work, but also to be able to uh, talk to talk, to, to bear witness. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not clear whether Stephen was really, really, really good at waiting tables, and that's why he had so much time you know, to be out in public, uh, or if he was really bad at it, and that's why he was out in public, or maybe he just uh, subcontracted the job to somebody else, maybe to some of the widows themselves, uh, who probably were like, we could have done this. Um, but it's, his story is really interesting, and there's a connection here to John 14 in that Jesus is offering his words literally hours before his arrest. And now we get Stephen uh, as well. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of traps in this story about falling into anti-Jewish attitudes or assumptions about who kills him and why. Um, if you need help with that, just send me an email. Uh, or, or, or read, or other read books. your book, yeah. Read books that I've written on <laughs> Acts. You could do that too. So, more on Acts, or do we, uh, well, we just got a, a psalm, quick... we got more really important First Peter stuff. Yeah, and we're at 20 minutes already, but a quick word on Acts, which is just, you know, uh, the long speech uh, that Peter gives, uh, that Stephen gives, is, you know, a, a long exegesis of the people's history, which has four. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? I was going to say Vorlage, the German word, which it has um, predecessors in the Old Testament in the Deuteronomic history. It goes back a couple of weeks ago. What you said, Matt, is at the end of Luke, uh, where Jesus is uh, said to be uh, interpreting the the scriptures to the to Cleopas and his companion on the way. And then, what does that look like? It doesn't say what text, but then it's really this. This gives us some idea of what that's like. I think. If you're going to preach on um, on Acts, you really need to kind of uh, set up for people at least something of that uh, that sermon, which ends with that climax. The uh, you know the the spirit of God does not dwell in buildings made of stone. So then, where does God dwell? Well, apparently uh, in the um, uh, in, in the bodies of people who are about to be martyred. Uh, quick mo uh, move to the Psalm. Um, Psalm 31, it, it's, it's here as a response to Acts because uh, what, what um, Stephen says at the end of Acts uh, as he's being um, killed, uh, what, I'm trying to find the exact, filled with the Holy Spirit. He, um, da, 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 that's not it. I just lost my place. But um, in, in, in uh, your hands, I commit my spirit. Right, which is, yeah. which is taken from Psalm 31, 5, into your hand, I commit my spirit. And then the, the lection um, omits a bunch of verses in Psalm 31 and it goes, uh, goes to the ending of it and picks it up with that image of hand again, where it says, my times are in your hand. So um, hands are, have been on our, our mind so much and will be on our mind, uh, which, is a, which is a nice link to today. Um, that uh, you know, uh, don't you, uh, who knows if the handshake will ever come back in our culture? But you know, we're told to wash hands and do it for 20 minutes, uh, not 20 minutes, 20 seconds. You know, saying Jesus loves me all the way through slowly, uh, so that you, it's 20 seconds. Uh, or from you, Matt, since you're not a singing person, just pray the Lord's prayer um, while you do it all the way through slowly. Uh, um, you know, don't touch, uh, don't touch I just, your I just face. I count to 20. I'm kind of old school, but that's just anyway. Oh, but, but keep going. You got a boy. Yeah, I, I, I'm not that. I can't count to twenty, so I have to sing. So, but um, hands. Uh, here's what I think is helpful about it, picking up the image of hands. Hand in the Old Testament are are really symbolic in ways that they aren't today. First of all, hands are a symbol of power. Um, so it's you know you're always, uh, people are always being given over into the hand of somebody, meaning to the power of, and including it's uh, symbolic of the power of God. Um, it's, a, it's also symbolic of honor. To sit at someone's right hand uh, or left hand is uh, the place of honor. So, um, and then it's also symbol, symbolic in the Psalms of one's character. Um, 
that is with your face or your voice, you can present a false face or you can lie, but your hands are absolutely unhideable. And so in the Psalms, it says things like, you know, wash your hands in innocence. That is really change your character. And only those with clean hands and pure heart can approach the presence of God. So, so what do you get? You got honor, you've got power, and you've got character. Um, which I think, and, and then the point is, our place of shame and our place of unrighteousness of, of character or our place of, of uh, lack of power, Jesus takes all those on in the cross and where his hands are crucified and nailed to the tree. And he then uh, exchanges his honor, righteous character and power for our powerlessness, unrighteousness and uh, shame. And so that, uh, you know, I, I think that whole thing in this context um, kind of plays well. Let me say something about First Peter. And of course, others might as well, too. That would be great. Uh, a lot of interesting identity formation <clears throat> going on here in, in Second Peter, First Peter 2, uh, 2 through 10. This language of, of being built into a house of a, of a new temple, uh, language about being a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Again, old imagery, in fact, actual language borrowed from, from the Old Testament here. And Exodus put 19. Forward. Yeah, to, to describe this new community. Again, this community that's described previously as exiles as well. Just important, I think, for how we think about the ways in which we also do this identity formation in our own preaching the way in which we give people images and names to understand who they are, to help them understand what kind of a community we are, uh, to use old images, but also bring in new and fresher images and to continue to help remind people, especially as we're at a time where the church is largely dispersed. Um, maybe that's changed in some places by, by May 10th, uh, most likely not, or at least if churches are starting to reopen, many people are not coming yet, um, and maybe for some good reasons, but that's, you know, always just a helpful way of, of reorienting people to not just identity, but also to, to their mission. So even if you don't want to borrow exactly what first Peter says, at least borrow the, uh, the impulse, right. Or the, the rationale for what the, uh, the author is trying to do here. And I'm assuming we don't want to like, like just talk about stones, like Stephen being stoned and then there's a stone and. Kind of too soon. You mean it's one of those things. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think too, like that identity of formation uh, is, is an important theme. I, you know, they leave off verse one, the lectionary leaves off verse one, but rid yourselves therefore of all malice, all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Uh, that those are not, those are not characteristics of a Christian community. And and instead long for the pure spiritual milk, uh, which you already know. And so I think too, the, the, you know, the way in which we um, imagine and talk about uh, the, the ways in which those five characteristics really undermine uh, community in such um, really destructive, profound ways uh, and that and yet we are called to, uh, you know, we are, we are chosen uh, a holy people that are called to a different way. And there's a distinctiveness in that, in that behavior that people should be able to recognize and to see. I think that's, that's never a message that gets old um, as, a, as a reminder and de describing of what, uh, what cr Christian community is all about. And if I can tie that back to the psalm, it is a community it is the mindset of a community that is safe and not one that is embarrassing, the refuge that Ralph brought up. 